What's the word, y'all? Welcome to the Kenny For Real All-Star Week. I know we a day late. Don't even think about that. Every single day, we will be tackling one award and giving my personal picks and basically diving into these things. And man, 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 I know we're going to make some people upset because because this year is like no other in a sense that it seems like every single award is up in the air except for one. And that, you know what, we might not even make a full six man of the year video because what the hell are we going to talk about other than say here, Tyler Hero. But with every single race being as close as it is. This is about to be a very interesting, very interesting week. I cannot wait to get into the comment section, but I do want to remind everybody here that I am just a dude with a microphone that watches some basketball. My opinion is not more valid than yours or any of your favorite creators, but I'm giving these awards as if I had a vote. If I had a ballot for rookie of the year, who would I give my rookie of the year to? We're going to do all rookie teams as well, so sit back, relax, and just remember, I'm just a dude with a microphone. So we're starting off Rookie of the Year because, in my opinion, it's one of the least significant awards that we're going to be giving out. It's like that and most improved player, I guess. I mean, I, I never look at a player's resume and be like, oh, he won Rookie of the Year. So when it's all said and done, he's a little bit more valuable than this player because he was in the same Jeff class and he didn't win Rookie of the Year. It doesn't matter. Like, when I think about Rookie of the Year, and I have to say this a hundred times, it feels like I am not projecting the value or projecting how good somebody in this draft class will be. I'm just saying, based on on the sample size from this rookie season this person had the best in my opinion and in a year like this there is no wrong answer as long as you narrowed it down to Evan Mobley Kate Cunningham and Scotty Barnes in my opinion they are all equally deserving of this award but that's not the way it works especially not in the Kenny for real universe this is not that about to be a Jason Kidd um Grant Hill year why did that just take me so long to think about that this is not about to be a Jason Kidd Grant Hill year where they were co-rookie of the years we don't do that around here we're going to be crowning a rookie of the year but before we even get into all of that I just want to talk about this draft class because this is one of the most impressive rookie year draft classes I have seen in some time and that's saying a lot because it feels like from 2017 until now, we keep getting rookies that come in and be impactful. Because I'm looking at it and just going through the draft class again, talking about the 60 picks and then some of the notable undrafted players, I just counted 22 players that I can say confidently are going to have a, a long NBA career. The level of success is up in the air. Are they going to be good role players for 10 years? Are they going to be superstars, all-star players? Up in the air. But I just counted 22 that I am pretty certain about. And then there are some people on the outside that could still do that thing. That's how good and how impressive of a draft class this is and then you asking me to narrow it down to the top 10 I just told you 20 would I say 22 I just told you it's 22 and I got to narrow it down to the top 10 when it comes to all NBA teams this is where things get a little bit interesting though and I wonder if this is going to be a year similar to like some of the previous years because we've definitely had years where all NBA or all rookie teams were more than 10 people because we got ties. In the 2012 NBA All-Star Award, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven NBA players that were on all-rookie first team because Iman Shumper, Kawhi Leonard, and Brandon Knight all tied up with 40 total votes. And when I look at this, you can convince yourself of a couple different people to snag like the last three spots. Like in my opinion, the top seven People that 100% deserve to be there are locked. So we're going to talk about that. But once we get to those last three, there are a couple different dudes that you can convince yourself deserves to be an all-rookie team. But I just went back in history, just recent history, and here are some names that made all-rookie teams to just showcase to you how damn good this draft class is. Yogi Ferrell, Langston Galloway, Kyle Sing Singler, Tyler Zeller are all players that were all-rookie teams. I don't see this all rookie class having names like that. That was just like, we might have a couple years in the NBA career, then we're done. And even the, the players in the rookie class that either didn't get a ton of PT or struggling in a rookie season, I can see some things in Jalen Suggs' game that I think will improve to make him a good player. I can see the, the sparks of Josh Primo when he's giving PT. And they, like he's not a conversation for all rookie teams, but I see the game when it's shot he hit a couple weeks ago. I see those type of things in this draft class. And we talked about this in our Enjoy Basketball space is the first official winner you gotta uh, follow the enjoy basketball twitter account um that they just feels like these draft class are gonna continue to get deeper and deeper and deeper and better and better and better because i just feel like we are we are starting at such a young age as society when it comes to these players and i've told this story before but it's very very relevant to this topic um i have a cousin his name is ej ej just finished up his freshman season at one of the top high schools when it comes to basketball in the city of chicago right when ej was two years old i vividly remember remember dude walking around the house with a basketball in his hands 
He didn't know much about basketball at that point, but his father, who's one of the top point guards in, in Chicago basketball high school history, had him playing basketball at that young. I remember him doing dribble drills at like four years old. And by the time he was seven, eight years old, he already had a real trainer. And now he's a freshman on varsity at one of the top teams in Chicago. That is how we are doing things with these younger generations. And I can just see it getting better and better and better. Like, I feel like the story of a ex person didn't pick up a basketball until he's 15 years old might be things of the past because, well, these kids are starting off so very young. That's always a crazy story. And then it's like Joel B, one of the greatest in the game, didn't pick up a basketball until he was like 14 years old, which is crazy how, how good he became. All right, all of that is done. Let's talk about all rookie teams. In my opinion, the top five is kind of set on all a rookie first team. We got Kay Cunningham. We have uh, uh, Jalen Green. We'll talk about Jalen Green in a second. We got Scotty Barnes, Evan Mobley, and Mo Wagner. That is my all-rookie first team. Jalen Green stepped onto the court with the Houston Rockets in, in this very early in his career, and he struggled heavily. I'm looking at his numbers right here. His first month of, month of basketball, which is really consisted of like six or seven games, he averaged 13 points per game on 33% shooting and 28% from the field. And a lot of people were, were on, his, on his neck, man. And I said the same thing about Cade, and I said the same thing about Emo. But like, these people are, are so highly scrutinized when it comes to the draft because, well, these are the top picks. And he definitely had some comments before and after the draft about a certain city and some organization. So he had even more people on his back that he didn't necessarily need to have if he didn't have to say these words. But since then, he's had so many opportunities. And with those opportunities, he's made up for, right? Where we just finished up the month of March. And in that month, he averaged 21 points per game on 48% shooting and 40% from three. He had to become an absolute bucket. Well, I think a lot of us knew that he was going to be, he is a bucket, but he's starting to show it at the NBA level. And even he said it um, at the end of his last game. He just finished four straight games where he put up 30 plus points. The first rookie to do that since Allen Iverson. So Jalen Green, it took him some time. But he put it together. And we're going to talk about Cade, Scotty, and Mobley once we get to the final three of rookie of the year. So I'm going to transition to Franz Wagner, who we mentioned before in the video last. We were talking about the Orlando Magic, one of the more impressive rookies for me. He was so very polished for a guy that a lot of people questioned whether or not he'd be able to score at the NBA level. I wish he got the ball more. It feels like more times than not, he's creating his shot on some cuts. And it's not a lot of times where they give him the ball and say, do you think? And if he did get that opportunity, he might be in a conversation for one of the top rookies. And we're talking about him for rookie of the year but I was so very impressed with him even though a lot of the times I feel like bros just be sitting in the corner shout out to him now when we get to the second team there are two names that I think are an absolute lock again I'm just a guy with a microphone so say what you go ahead send me that three paragraph long thing and talking about why I snubbed this guy and why why Kenny is wrong the first lock on all rookie second team is Herb Jones um and number two is Josh Giddy. Herb Jones averaged 9.6 points per game, about four rebounds and two assists. The numbers do not jump off the, the, the page whatsoever. But if you are really tuned in, you're watching Herb Jones and the Pelicans play, you can see how impactful he is as a player. We're talking about a primary defender that can be playing uh, uh, guarding guards and go all the way down the fours. He ain't got it just yet to guard uh, centers because he's only 200 pounds soaking wet but he has the defensive side of the ball. And if you want to go even deeper and start talking about things that we don't normally talk about in this channel, which is advanced stats, the advanced stats absolutely love Herb Jones. When he is on the floor, the Pelicans are, are such a better team. We're talking about the difference between an average team to a really good playoff team when Herb Jones is on the floor. Their points per possession go up plus six when he's on the floor, and their opposing team's points per possession goes down uh, 3.2. And if you need to know, that puts him in the 89th percentile on offense and then the 75th percentile on defense defense when he is on the floor and that is in 2,200 minutes so it's not like there's a small sample size Herb was starting for a good point of the season a good portion of the season and there's not many players that have impacted their team on the advanced analytics side like Herb Jones has especially in the rookie class and then Josh Giddy averaged 12 8 and 6 um, has some of the best vision in the entire draft class. His jump shot has not come along, and his scoring overall hasn't come along. So the fact that bro averaged 12 and a half points is, is a surprise to me because uh, he's not that great on that side of the ball when it comes to scoring. But all in due time, I definitely can say that he was one of the top seven rookies in this class this first season. And before we get into our last three, I'm going to give you all my honorable mentions. These are the people that just missed the cut on these things. Trey Mann impressed me a lot this season. Uh, Davion Mitchell kicked it up, especially in the second half of the season and especially in the last two weeks or so. But I'm not just using those last two weeks to show that he deserves to be here. Alperin Sengun deserves a lot of love. One of my favorite rookies in this class. 
Cam Thomas came in and scored when they asked him to, but the sample size wasn't big enough. Jonathan Kaminga wasn't given enough PT 100%. I feel like if he was getting 20 minutes a game, 25 minutes a game, he would have made one of these two lists, but they didn't give him that. I was impressed with the way he played in the minutes he was given, though. And uh, Jose Alvarado, man, I'm going to show you a little bit of love, even though you shouldn't really be in these conversations for the top 10 in the class, but you know I got love for you. All right, so let's get to the, the three people that we, we, we decided to add to the the last of the second team. The first one is Chris Dorte. Though he cooled off a little bit and though he missed a chunk of the season, especially like right now, um, the very early stages of Chris Dorte's rookie season was incredible. We're talking about game winners. We're talking about him going out and putting up 20s. But even though he cooled off, his, his overall stats from this rookie season is at least good enough to get him on the second team. All right. Um... Say, say what you want about this pick. Maybe it's a homer pick, but but I've watched Ayo Desumo every single minute of his NBA career so far, and he is such a very impactful player. The count of stats is definitely not going to jump off the page for you, like similarly to Herb Jones, but they are the advanced stats show that he is one of the best on-ball defenders in the entire NBA, and we're talking about a rookie here. He's, he's taking the hardest matchup, especially with Alex Caruso and Lonzo Ball out of the lineup, and he's doing his best, and he's, he's hitting his shots more than I think a lot of people expected him to hit out of Illinois, and I just think he deserves to be on the second team maybe that's a homer pick but I, I really enjoy watching Ayo Desumu and the very last guy the 10th man in my all NBA all rookie teams is Bones Highland shout out to shout out to Bones I like a story of a player that is drafted late that doesn't get a lot of PT and then as the season goes on the coaching staff starts to start to trust him more and more and more and there was a time where he was playing like behind, uh, behind Compazzo and then eventually they was like you know what we're going to let Bones be our backup point guard. And since they've done that, he's been very, very good. He's been getting adequate amount of minutes, and he's been showing the world that even though he was drafted very late, he can still be a player in this NBA. Okay. Shout out to the people that didn't make the list, but, hey, I got a love for Eladius. Now we have to finally, I feel like I've been putting it off, we have to finally talk about my rookie of the year. As you know, it's been narrowed down to the final three guys, Kay Cunningham, Evan Mobley, and Scotty Barnes. All three of them impressed me so heavily. And I was trying to figure out where I want to weight what is most important, right? Cade Cunningham 100% is, is the most uh, more impactful offensive player, the more, most skilled offensive player, and he looks like a guy that can run your offense for 20 years, and you'd be very, very happy for him to do that. Evan Mobley looks like he could be a generational defensive player, and the offense didn't look too bad either. And then Scotty Barnes has a little bit of all of that, right? Scotty Barnes can play your point guard, which he did this season. He can play your shooter guard, which he did this season. He can play your small forward, which he did this season. He can play your power forward. You get what I'm saying, right? Scotty Barnes has been has been one of the most versatile players, and I'm not just talking about his rookie class, but I'm talking about in the entirety of the NBA. But the Rookie of the Year award has never been about winning games, right? Because you got to think about it like this. More likely than not, if you're a top rookie, you were drafted to an ass team, right? Uh, Kay Cunningham and the Detroit, the Detroit Pistons had the number one pick for a reason, right? They put together a bad roster on purpose so they can go in here to get that first overall pick, and it worked. And they got a guy in Kay Cunningham who might be very, very, or seems like he's going to be very, very good. So I don't want to penalize Kay Cunningham because his team won 20-something games because – well, he was good, especially when you take out of, out of the minutes where he's playing on a bum ankle and he was trying to learn the pacing of the NBA. If you get rid of that first month, Kay Cunningham's statistics are wild, but it is rookie of the year. And I got to look at the entire sample size and not just get rid of an entire month. I'm trying to figure out the right way to say this. I'm not devaluing Kay Cunningham's case of rookie of the year because his team is bad. He can't really control that, right? I'm not saying that he's lower on the list because his team won 20 games. I can't do that to him. That's unfair to him because if you look at his starting lineup that he played with all season, they compare it to Evan Mobley's starting lineup or compare it to Scotty Barnes' starting lineup, you can tell which team won 20 games and which team hasn't. Emo played with two other All-Stars and, and, and Scotty played with All-Star Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam, who in my opinion is an All-NBA player. So they've had better rosters around them. So I can't discredit Cade for not making the playoffs or playing on a bad team. But what I will do is say that Evan Mobley and Scotty Barnes are huge players on those playoff teams, right? I'm adding them being very impactful players on playoff teams as a plus for them and not saying that's a negative for K. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. There was a game very early in, in Evan Mobley's uh, career where he played against the Atlanta Hawks. And I've told this story in our podcast if you've been listening to it. And there were two back-to-back -back possessions where he switched onto Trey Young 
and I was so very impressed. I had interviewed Evan Mobley a couple a month before the NBA draft, and like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a college basketball watcher, but I did my due diligence, right? If I'm gonna interview a person or a player, I'm gonna try to dive deep into their life, into their film, to figure out, okay, what what do I need to know about this person? And I saw what a lot of people saw, right? I saw that Evan Mobley was a really good defender. I saw that his offense are probably gonna be really good eventually, but I didn't expect him to be able to switch on to one of the the NBA's top guards. And hold his own. Now, I don't trust him to do that 48 minutes a game. I don't trust him to guard Trey Young 48 minutes a game. But in those possessions, I saw a guy that was generationally good as a rookie defender. And I was impressed. And then I look back on, it might have been the third game of Scotty Barnes' NBA career against the Boston Celtics in Boston. And I just remember so many possessions in that game where, where he looked like the best player on the entire court, obviously. He was on court with Jason Tatum, with Jalen Brown, with Pascal, and with Fred Van Vliet. But in that game, one of his first games of his NBA career, there were multiple times where I thought to myself, he is the best player on the court today. Cutting, defense, rebounding, playmaking, spot-up shooting, mid-range jump shot, uh, crashing the glass. He put everything together in one of his first games of his NBA career, and I was highly impressed. So like I said, man, as long as you have one of these top three guys – I can't make an argument that you're wrong, right? But if I had a ballot and I can only pick one of the dudes, my rookie of the year is Scotty Barnes. And the reason I picked him over the other two candidates, and it was a hard decision. It, it was literally down to the wire. And, and, and even now that I'm saying this, it is what it is, right? The reason why I picked him over the other candidates is that I think he has had the most well-rounded campaign and I think he has showed the most versatility of the three guys. Who's going to be the best NBA player of the three? Not super relevant to my rookie of the year. But there's times where, where like Fred Van Vliet goes down with an injury. You know who he's starting at point guard? Scotty Barnes. You know what he did? He facilitated the hell out of the ball. There's times where he legitimately played center in lineups. And he was cleaning the glass. Getting blocks. And no matter who you ask him to guard, he's going to go out there and he's going to give a valiant effort and do a pretty decent job. The rookie wall is something that I think every rookie ends up hitting. So, I mean, some people hit it very early on and get over it, and I think that's the case with Kay Cunningham um, with the injury and him trying to adjust the pace. Or with Evan Mobley, unfortunately for him, he hit the rookie wall and then got injured like a week later. So, like, the, the lasting images of Evan Mobley in a, lot of people's, um, in a lot of people's mind is, like, the last two weeks of the season, he averaged, like, eight points per game. And then he got injured, which is unfortunate for his campaign. Um, but Scotty continue to be well-rounded throughout all of that. And it was hard to make this decision, man. I think all three guys are very deserving. Um, there's been times in this season where I've tuned into the Detroit Pistons and Kay Cunningham legitimately has taken over games. The only one that comes to mind right now is the, is the one against the Brooklyn Nets because it's on top of my mind. He scored like 14 straight points for the Detroit Pistons in a close game against the Brooklyn Nets, you know? And with Evan Mobley, one of the things I really love about his game is that he's not one of those big men that is afraid to take care of a mismatch. I, I hate it when we have a near seven footer, a seven footer that can have somebody small in their back and he doesn't demand the ball. He doesn't ask for the ball. Evan Mobley does that. Every single time Evan Mobley has played against Chicago Bulls who run notoriously small where like Javante Green is at the four. Javante is guarding Evan Mobley and Evan Mobley is demanding the ball on the block. I love that about his game. As a help defender, Evan Mobley is elite. As a rim protector, Evan Mobley is elite. But I can only pick one guy and the guy I decided to pick with Scotty Barnes. And I think every single time I do one of these, um, before I go into the film session, I'm going to tweet out asking y'all who your rookie of the year is. So be sure to follow me at, at KOT4Q. And I'm looking at the results with just four minutes left. This is greatly timed. 17,000 votes. That's a very good sample size. Shout out to everybody that voted in this one. I turned off the replies because I didn't want people to get influenced by other people. But then I remember that quote tweets were thing. And um, yeah, the quote tweets kind of, Kind of went insane. Um, anyway, in this in this tweet, 44% of the votes went to Evan Mobley, that is first place. 30% of the votes went to Kay Cunningham, that is second place. And 26% of the votes went to Scotty Barnes, and that is last place. I do not make these videos where I'm giving my opinion to please people. I don't pander to people. And I think everybody that voted here has a legitimate reason for them having their vote. I just have Scotty Barnes as my number one. Welcome to Award Week, man. Hopefully that was a good video for you, even if you disagree with everything I said in this one. If you did, um, 
like it, leave it a like. If you disliked it, don't dislike my damn video. Even though YouTube got rid of the dislike like feature, I can still see the dislike. So if you dislike it, know that I will see that and it will hurt my feelings.